Welcome one and all to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show where we recap all the launches we saw last week, dive into the latest news regarding SpaceX's Starship development, and then look ahead to the coming days at all the launches and historic spaceflight anniversaries that we can expect to take place. Before we start, make sure you're subscribed. This ensures that you're notified of these videos when they go live, so that the content we're about to cover is correct and up to date. Comment if you're one of the Pog champs watching on March 22nd. Anyway, on to our first segment, which is a little bit different. I thought I'd give Starship Development its very own segment. Feedback is appreciated on the following. SpaceX have been hard at work, as usual, down at Boca Chica, with works continuing on both expanding the rocket farm itself and, of course, the Starship vehicles. I think the most exciting development from last week was the stacking of Super Heavy BN-1. This is the first prototype of SpaceX's colossal Starship first stage, and it's very exciting to finally see it stacked. Austin Barnard took this great time lapse showing the whole procedure. As you can see, SpaceX used a crane that extended over the top of the high bay building and then lowered its hook through a hole in the ceiling. I guess MacGyver solutions are needed while we wait for the assembly building to be completed and have its own internal crane systems. We've always known that Super Heavy would be a gigantic structure, but seeing it in real life finally allows reality to set in in terms of visualizing just how big this thing is. Look at how small the people are next to it. It's important to note that while the BN-1 is very exciting, it's not actually going to fly. That's going to be the objective of BN-2. BN-1 is a Pathfinder vehicle similar to the Starship Mark 1. It's a production prototype that SpaceX will use to figure out how to construct and transport the colossal rocket at 70 meters high. I imagine moving it would be a fairly complicated process. We may see a cryo test, but this prototype will stay firmly on the ground. On the subject of the Starship vehicle itself, the SN-11 could well be days away from becoming the fourth full-scale Starship prototype to make a high-altitude flight. Last week, we saw a very brief static fire on the 15th of March at suborbital pad B. However, the test was aborted immediately following Raptor ignition. SpaceX planned to attempt a second static fire no earlier than today, the 22nd of March, so this may well have already happened by the time you're watching this video. If this succeeds, we may see a flight test as early as the 24th of March. Very exciting stuff, and a real testament to just how fast SpaceX are getting with their Starship development. Reddit user Chris J. Billington created this graphic comparing the development of SN8, SN9, SN10, and SN11, and you can see how much the timeline has been shrinking with each successive vehicle. With the SN15 almost ready for nose cone stacking in the high bay, I don't think we'll have to wait very long at all for a flight following the hopeful success of the SN11. Now, that's a wrap of my quick rundown of all the Starship news from last week. Let us now take a look at news from last week elsewhere in the space industry, as well as recap all the launches we saw. As always though guys, if you are enjoying this video so far and maybe learning a thing or two, then do consider leaving a like down below, it really helps us to survive and all that. One big piece of news from last week was the successful green run of NASA's space launch system Core Stage. A previous static fire was conducted on the 16th of January, but of course this shut down earlier than expected, managing only about one minute of firing before shutdown, rather than the planned eight minutes. Luckily, it was later confirmed that the shutdown was due to conservative test thresholds that are specific only for ground testing and not for flight, so it really wasn't a huge problem. The second hot fire test we saw last week on the 18th of March went on for much longer, with all four RS-25 engines igniting successfully. The four massive engines throttled down as expected in order to simulate in-flight conditions, and the gimbaling profiles of the engines were tested as well, making this only a sort of static fire test, I suppose. With this test success under their belts, NASA will ship the core stage down to the Kennedy Space Center to be mated with the rest of the rocket for Artemis 1 after its engines are refurbished by Boeing, the prime contractor for SLS. With the static fire test success, and of course the previous successful testing of the rocket's solid rocket boosters, hopefully we may at long last get to see this much delayed rocket take flight in November this year. 
The original launch date for the SLS was in late 2016, so it's relieving to see things finally start coming together. We'd hoped to see some rockets actually fly last week as well, but sadly no flights took place, both in terms of orbital and suborbital trajectories. We'd hoped to see a Soyuz and a Falcon 9 take to the skies, but sadly these were delayed to this week, so we can discuss these in our next segment. Which, I guess, actually, I see no reason to delay any further. This week has a few orbital rocket launches in store for us, and actually the first one should have already happened. That's because it's today, March 22nd, scheduled to be only an hour or so before this video's publication. This will be a Soyuz 2.1A and is the launch that we'd hoped to have seen last week. It will launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome with numerous satellites on board for a variety of clients. In total, there are 40 satellites inside the payload fairing, originating from South Korea, Japan, the United Arab Emirates, Israel, Germany, Russia, Slovakia, the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Italy, Kenya, Spain, Thailand, Argentina, Hungary, and finally, <laughs> there's one satellite from Tunisia called Challenge 1. It's a satellite for the Internet of Things and is the first ever Tunisian satellite. Here's hoping the launch goes well and isn't postponed again, although I'm optimistic that it'll go well given the famous reliability of the Soyuz launch vehicle. The next launch of the week will also be today, albeit a little bit later on. It's Rocket Lab's latest Electron launch, dubbed They Go Up So Fast. It will once again be launching from the Mahia Peninsula, and on board the Electron will be an American Black Sky Global Observation Satellite, an American Gunsmoke J-1 technology demonstration satellite and an American Very Hatchling meteorology satellite. There's also four satellites on behalf of New Zealand. One is a Centauri 3 Internet of Things CubeSat, two M2 technology demonstration CubeSats and a Miriota 7 Internet of Things CubeSat as well. All those satellites aside, I think the most exciting passenger is one from Rocket Lab themselves. It's their second Photon satellite, which will be used to perform tests in preparation for the up upcoming Capstone mission, which is a planned lunar orbiter that will test and verify the predicted orbital stability planned for the Lunar Gateway space station. Very exciting stuff, and that's a launch that I can't wait to see later this year. After Electron, the next launch will be on the 24th of March, which will be SpaceX's latest Starlink mission, Starlink L-22. This will be the sixth flight of this particular Falcon 9 first stage, and it's expected to land 633 kilometers downrange on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, and the fairing halves are expected to splash down and be recovered from the water a little bit further down as well. The payload will once again be 60 Starlink satellites, which will join SpaceX's rapidly expanding Starlink megacon installation, which when complete will provide high-speed satellite internet on a near-global scale. Really, there's not much more to discuss with this one. It's a pretty standard Starlink launch, which is very telling of the times we live in when you think about it, when the prospect of a rocket landing itself for the seventh time in a row is something considered routine, which is, I suppose, nothing but a good thing, really. The next launch of the week will be on the 25th of March, and will be a Soyuz 2.1, carrying 36 satellites for the British OneWeb Communication Satellite Network. The Soyuz will launch from the Vostokny Cosmodrome, which is still a fairly new launch complex, based in Russia and is designed to reduce Roscosmos' reliance on the Baikonur Cosmodrome, which is based in Kazakhstan. To cap off the week, India will launch a GSLV Mark II rocket on the 28th of March from the Satish Dhawan launch site, carrying an EOS-03 satellite, an Earth observation satellite, to geosynchronous Earth orbit. If all proceeds as planned, that will be the final launch of the week, which means we can now move along to our final segment of the show, all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries that we can expect to see this week. <laughs> Our first historic anniversary of the week will take place tomorrow, on the 23rd of March, when in 1965 NASA launched Gemini 3, the United States' first two-man spaceflight. The preceding Gemini missions 1 and 2 were uncrewed test flights, Gemini 1 being to certify the Titan 2 launch vehicle for manned flight, and Gemini 2 being to certify the Gemini spacecraft itself. Despite both the Gemini 1 and 2 flights being a success, I am sure it was still a relief to see the Gemini 3, with astronauts Gus Grissom and John Young on board, safely return to Earth after three low Earth orbits. 
While not a test flight in the same sense as the Gemini 1 and 2, Gemini 3 was still very much designed to ensure that the spacecraft would operate as intended, with a primary mission goal to test the new Gemini spacecraft. The crew fired thrusters to change the shape of their orbit, alter their orbital plane, and slightly lower their orbit's apogee. After successful splashdown, the Gemini capsule was recovered and is now on display within the Gus Grissom Memorial of Spring Mill State Park, Indiana. On the same day as Gemini 3, but this time in 2001, the Russian Mir space station gave us a fiery swan song. On this day, it was disposed of as it was becoming too costly for Roscosmos to continue funding, and with construction of the International Space Station beginning, it was soon to become obsolete. Thus, it was sent hurtling into the Earth's atmosphere, breaking apart and falling into the Southern Pacific Ocean. It had a good old life though, serving from 1986 to 2001, and it was a significant achievement for humanity in several different ways. Chiefly, it was the first modularly assembled space station assembled in orbit, and it was the first continuously inhabited long-term orbital research station. To this day, it also holds the record of sporting the longest ever single human spaceflight, with Valery Polyakov spending 437 days on board. I think I'd have gone a little bit mad spending over a year in such a place myself. On the 25th of March in 1655, Saturn's largest moon, Titan, was discovered by Dutch scientist Christian Huygens. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system, second only to Jupiter's Ganymede, and it's larger than the planet Mercury. It's all in all a very exciting moon, it's the only known moon to have a dense atmosphere, and the only known body in space, other than the Earth of course, to have stable bodies of surface liquid. It's these features that are the reason that Titan is often described as being a planet-like moon. For a long time, its thick atmosphere impeded scientists from being able to deduce what its surface was like, much like with the planet Venus before the Soviet Venera program, until the 2004 Cassini-Huygens mission could provide new insight. Literally, the Cassini probe deployed the Huygens lander to touch down on the alien surface of the moon, sending back these photographs, which look eerily similar to the Earth in a way, but of course, taken from an entirely other world. Crazy stuff! The Cassini probe itself imaged the freezing methane lakes of Titan, using infrared imaging to pierce through the clouds and provide us with this globe view of the moon, tearing down the secrets long hidden by the occlusive atmosphere. Our final anniversary of the week is on the 25th of March again, but this time in 1979 when the first fully functional space shuttle, the Columbia, was delivered to the Kennedy Space Center to be prepared for its maiden launch, which would take place on April the 12th, 1981. The Columbia would go on to serve for over 22 years, completing 27 missions before tragically disintegrating during re-entry of its 28th mission on the 1st of February 2003. One of its missions, STS-3, actually took place on this very day, March the 22nd in 1982, of course provided you're watching this on the day of publication. The mission involved extensive orbital endurance testing of the Columbia vehicle, as well as numerous scientific experiments. STS-3 was also the very first shuttle launch with an unpainted external fuel tank, left in its now iconic orange colour rather than being painted white. The delivery of the Columbia is the final anniversary I wanted to discuss this week, which brings an end to this week's history segment. And that's it, another episode of Space This Week is behind us. I do hope you all enjoyed the ride, and while it was fun reflecting on last week's events, I'm extremely excited about the coming days, with the Starship SN11 purportedly days away from its flight. SpaceX are getting nail-bitingly close to a total flight and landing success for a Starship prototype, and remember everyone, one like equals one prep for the SN11 being the vehicle to finally do it. If you want to check out more things than the Shinabian end screen, the left panel is a link to the full Space This Week playlist, the right is a link to a video selected for you by YouTube, and the description should have links to follow me on social media such as Twitter, where I regularly post things ahead of my scheduled YouTube uploads. That's all from me today, so I'll see you next on Saturday for a Kerbal Deep Space SSTO chase.